Inside this video right here, we're gonna talk about stroke and everything you need to know from EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic, about stroke care so you can take care of your patient out in the field. Let's dive into it. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school, for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that. And I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that. Hey everyone, it's Paramedic Coach here, back at you with another video. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button down below and make sure to join us by hitting that notification bell. That way you see all the great EMS content here on this channel. And finally, smash and annihilate that like button. Go ahead, hit the like button right now for the YouTube algorithm and let's dive into this week's topic, which is stroke in EMS. I'm giving you everything I got here, let's dive into it. So, first with strokes, there's two main pathways, if you will. Now, what is a stroke? All it is, is essentially, is there's a reason for it. Lack of blood flow to the brain. That's the big issue here, right? Either by a clot or by the bursting of a blood vessel. That's what we're gonna talk about now. Now, here it is. If we have an ischemic stroke, you'll see the picture here of the clot versus the bursting. If we have a stroke in the brain, right, there's an artery that has a clot in it that is ischemic. If we have a, that same vessel, let's say it's that, that, that same artery, and it bursts open, too much pressure, we're going to talk about that in a second, right? What's going to happen? It bursts, now we have blood in the brain, what happens next? Well, that's a stroke. That's a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? Now, ever hear the old saying, wow, your blood pressure is really high, you're gonna have a stroke. That's where the hemorrhagic stroke gets its name, that's where it comes from. So the next thing I wanna talk about is risk factors in your patient of having a stroke. Let's talk about that. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about risk factors with stroke. Now you're gonna notice a lot of similarities to stroke risk factors to risk factors of having a heart attack. But check this out. We have high blood pressure. We have diabetes. We have AFib. We have smoking. Obviously, it goes without saying, advanced age. Now, here's, a, here's a basically what I call the big five. High blood pressure, smoking, a previous TIA, AFib, and diabetes. I would say these are the five worst risk factors you can have for having a stroke. So now the next thing I wanna talk about in this video right here, we're gonna talk about how to actually assess a stroke. We're gonna go from general to a little more detailed. And then we're gonna talk later on about, hey, what is this TIA? Let's talk about that next. Now the best way to assess for stroke is what I call think fast. So the mnemonic is fast. So the first thing we're gonna look for is any signs of facial droop, number one, okay? So it could be on one side or the other, okay? It's gonna droop down the face. Step two is we're gonna check for arm drift. So you're gonna close your eyes, tell the patient to bring their arms up, and then what's gonna happen if you're having a stroke is you're gonna have weakness on one of the sides of the body. So let's say you go like this and then this drops. They can't hold their arms up. That would be number two. Now the next is S, that's for speech. Do they have slurred speech or can they not speak? Quick tip here, I've done a lot of strokes in my career, I've done a lot of strokes and here's two things I find I wanna tell you about with speech. Number one is I find more of the time that they're unable to speak. And number two what I find is you, when you look at the, their face and they're doing your exam, if they're still obviously awake, right, their eyes are open, you'll see almost a fearness and an anxiety in their eyes. That's what you'll see in their eyes, just from what I've seen um, in my experience. Okay, just something that you know, almost like they're looking around the room. If you, when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. But I want to give you that tip. Now, T uh, is for time. 
Time means when was the last time that they were seen normal? That's what we gotta know, right? So here's the question. Is it yes, they were seen normal, confirmed by a family, a friend, a bystander, we get that information on scene? Or is it a no or unknown, right? We Nobody knows, right? An unknown would be, for example, that there's nobody on scene, just a patient and they're showing symptoms, right? So this is a fast exam. This is how we actually you know, assess for stroke. Now, next thing I wanna talk about is just very quickly is uh, what exactly is a TIA? Let's talk about that. Now with TIA, that stands for transient ischemic attack. That is basically a mini stroke. Now, with a TIA patient, they're gonna appear just like a stroke patient. In EMS, we won't be able to tell the difference between a TIA and a stroke. That comes later on in hospital. See, within 24 hours, all their symptoms will go away, right? Inside of 24 hours. It could be minutes, could be hours, but it's under 24 hours. They call that a TIA. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say someone was having stroke-like symptoms for a period of 15 minutes and it passes, right? That's the TIA. What if it lasted for an hour and, and then it's gone and, it, and they're all back to normal? That's where they go from having an event, go back to normal. That's a TIA, it's a mini stroke, right? Now, the problem with TIA is most people that have a TIA have a real stroke later and that doesn't just go away, that's permanent and needs an intervention and even then the outcome is bleak. Strokes are a big deal, guys, right? So that's the thing about a TIA, which is so ominous is that, okay, well, that means they're probably having a stroke at some point later on. So the next thing I want to talk about moving forward with stroke, we talked about assessments, uh, different types, stuff like that. I want to give you a little bit more detail about some of the signs and symptoms when that patient is having a stroke. Let's talk about that. I want to go over here just my mindset when approaching the stroke patient. Now, look, if you go to a patient with any of these signs and symptoms, and I'll give you an example. If your patient has a headache and has nausea and is 200 over 100, right? I'm gonna do other assessments, but I'm thinking it could be a stroke patient, right? So here are some of the things that I look at. High blood pressure, unexplained headaches, unexplained uh, nausea, vomiting, stuff like that. And if that happens acutely with confusion or altered mental status, we are thinking about a neuro emergency, right? So that's what I wanna get into your head here is, headaches with high blood pressure, nausea, vomiting, we're thinking about a neuro emergency, right? If you're just starting off an EMS, that's the best thing I can give you as far as signs and symptoms. You have your FAST exam for stroke, but if you add in this, now you're really looking good. So here's the bonus I wanna give you guys in this video, which is what I call a sneaky stroke. It's a cerebellar event, right? Here's what happens. What happens if instead of the middle cerebral artery, where I'd say eight out of 10, nine out of 10 strokes happen, what if we get a stroke back here to the cerebellum? Let's talk about that. Now what I call the sneaky stroke is a stroke, it's not, it doesn't happen very often, but I don't want you to miss this, okay? Now remember, most strokes, majority of them happen in the middle cerebral artery. That's why we do the fast exam, okay? Now, a sneaky, less common stroke that you may encounter is a stroke back here to the cerebellum. Now, here it is. It's a cerebellar event or a cerebellar stroke. It presents with these signs and symptoms right here. Now, your patient will have a really immense headache and nausea vomiting. Remember before we talked about that, but here's the pearl, a few things. One, on pupil exam, you'll see nystagmus, that fluttering in the eyes. Nystagmus is a very, very important physical sign of that. Number two is you're gonna have a patient whose gait and balance is off. 
doesn't make any sense. And you're also, they probably are gonna have a vertigo as well, okay? Vertigo as well. So what does that mean? Your patient has an intense headache, nausea, vomiting, vertigo, nystagmus, and can't walk, unexplained uh, balance, gait issues, falling over the place. That could be a cerebellar event, my friends. Now we're gonna wrap this up with our BLS and our ALS stroke care. Here we go. Okay, my friends, now here's how we're gonna care for a stroke. I want you to imagine this. You walk on scene to an 80-year-old female patient and she's confused. The, what's the first thing that we're gonna do? We have confusion, what are we gonna do? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is do our exams and assessments. Now you have a partner. While you're doing that, let's get a blood sugar going at the same time. Then let's get vitals going. In a matter of moments, we're gonna know our FAST exam. We're gonna know other physical exam uh, findings. We're gonna know vital signs and the blood sugar. Now the most important thing is this. No stroke is a stroke until we get a blood sugar. Now why is that? Well the reason for that is very simple. If a patient is hypoglycemic, they have low blood glucose, low blood sugar levels, then guess what? That means that that can mimic a stroke. So we have to look at that first. And then let's say we, our patient, our 80 year old female, is a, has a positive uh, fast exam, right? And let's say her blood sugar is in normal limits and she has high blood pressure. What? Let's call a stroke alert, correct? That would be the right thing. Now we do that. So we call a stroke alert. What do we do now? Now, rapid transport. We've got to get this patient to a stroke center. That's the most important thing. Our goal in EMS is to rapidly recognize this. Do what we got to do with our exam and assessments and get them to a stroke center. Ultimately, their care for this emergency is going to be fully in hospital. Our goal here with stroke is to do our routine BLS, routine ALS. Our goal is to find it early so we can alert and open up the hospital resources. That is the goal for our stroke patient. Obviously, if you're a paramedic, you would start two IVs, of course. That makes a lot of sense. And obviously, getting in route to the hospital, it's not going to hurt. Obviously, we have time. We're going to have done many of these strokes. Not going to hurt to do an EKG. Okay, not gonna, right now one thing that's very interesting that I will mention here is sometimes if someone's having a stroke they can actually get some flip T waves on 12 lead EKG do I know why I don't know why exactly but I do know that is a fact that I've learned that so I want to uh, pass it off to you as well my friends so here is our patient exams blood glucose alert early routine BLS get your IVs routine ALS your job is to recognize early, and that's how we impact our stroke patient. Now, finally, if you're one of these three people, I have something for you down below in the link in the description. Now, if you are preparing for EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic school, or maybe right now you're someone who's struggling in class trying to get this information in, but you're going through a textbook and you're like, I can't do this, you need more help, you need extra help, or maybe you're someone who's getting ready for a national registry and you wanna make sure you're ready for that cognitive exam. Right down in the description is my Paramedic Coach Video Library course. It has over 160 videos of my very best content. If you enjoyed this, then you're gonna absolutely fall in love with the content in that course. Plus, you get access to me as your coach inside our private community, and we are thousands strong. Now, my friends, hope so much um, that you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Kept, oh, like everything that you were saying was just connecting all these, all these, you know, links inside my brain, and I, I just knew right then and there, um, I have to have this program. I have to have all the information that he's willing to give. I need all of it. I went through it. I, I spent the time and money in other areas, and I'm, I'm just gonna let you guys know that uh, this was everything I was searching for the whole time. The first couple of videos I watched, um, 
what I noticed it, it just I, I just immediately started connecting dots um, on some of these things I, I didn't have grasped. Went on there and then I continued reviewing and I did it for about a month and you know it, it helped a lot. Like I said, even after school and I took that test one time and I passed it. Your particular program, you have your students engaging and you have your students discussing and you have your students actually using your products. And I'm seeing time and time again, um, students that are coming in and announcing their new certification with National Registry. Olds obviously passing the exam doing it pretty quickly, 70 questions in about an hour. Um, well, you definitely are like how your videos are. Like, I wasn't sure how it was going to be, but you are how you, your videos are. So that was awesome. So people who are getting ready for paramedic school, or if you're getting ready to go in the Navy as a corpsman or as an Army medic, um, you got to prepare yourself. Evan, I know you got a program that helps people prepare that way. So bottom line is, guys, you don't ever want to hear something for the first time with a bunch of other students. So if you're in a competitive learning environment, you don't want to hear about AFib for the first time where everybody else, you want to have an understanding of it before you walk in the room. From 120 questions, passing two sections, um, near passing one, and then I think two below passing to 70 questions passing completely. $7,000 for school plus everything else that you put into it all the time and all the time off work and family and everything. It's to see people fail and fail and fail and then just quit, which I know a couple of people who have, I tend to say, you know, it doesn't hurt to have somebody right there to talk to, you know, send a question. Anytime I get the chance, I'll, I'll gladly offer or advise them to sign up for you and your paramedic coach. It's, it's truly helpful and amazing at what you do. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school, for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that. And I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that.